muscles are quite important as their contraction and relaxation allows us to perform movements and carry objects. These muscles are controlled by the nervous system. The connection between the nerve terminals and the muscle fiber is known as the neuromuscular junction. In a condition known as myasthenia gravis, there are autoantibodies which are synthesized against the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors found at the neuromuscular junction. Often, this condition is also associated with B cells and T cell involvement. Once the nicotinic receptor is blocked by these autoantibodies, it means the impulse can no longer be transported to the muscle fibers, and this results in fatigable muscle weakness, usually in the following order. Number one, extraocular muscle involvement, causing ptosis and diplopia, which are often the presenting complaints in 50% of the cases. Number two, bulbar involvement, causing dysarthria, dysphonia, and dysphagia. Number three, facial involvement, causing myasthenic snarl on smiling. Number four, the neck involvement, and eventually the limb girdle involvement causing proximal weakness and eventually involvement of the trunk. Exacerbating events could include intercurrent illnesses, hypokalemia, overtreatment, altered climate, physiological stress such as pregnancy, emotion, and exercise, as well as drugs such as aminoglycosides, tetracycline, opioids, quinine, and beta blockers. Signs of myasthenia gravis include fatigability where an individual cannot hold their eyes in an upward gaze for more than a few seconds. Their voice may also become quiet on counting to 50, and when their eyes are shut, it is easy to open them. It is important to note that reflexes, bulk, tone, and sensation are normal in these individuals. Remember, myasthenia gravis has a prevalence of 1 in 8,000 and often has two peak incidences. The first being young females aged 20 to 40, and the second being older males aged 50 to 80, though it can happen at any age. In young females, it may be associated with autoimmune diseases such as SLE and rheumatoid arthritis, as well as a thymic hyperplasia. While as in older men, it can be associated with thymic atrophy or thymoma in 10% of the cases. Investigations include checking for autoantibodies to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is often about 90% sensitive or 70% if the patient has ocular disease only. These autoantibodies may be positive in other individuals with conditions such as Lambert-Eaton syndrome, thymomas, or small cell lung carcinomas. If these autoantibodies are not present, you may check for other autoantibodies against the muscle-specific kinase, which are positive in a third of the cases, and anti-Smith antibodies. Other special tests include an electromyograph, which should involve repetitive nerve stimulation and single nerve electromyography. An ice test can also be done, which involves placing an ice pack to a closed eyelid for two to five minutes. Ptosis is noted to improve in myasthenia gravis when this is done. The Tensilon test can also be done where a response to sequential doses of a short-acting IV cholinesterase inhibitor such as edrophonium causes transient increase in power. This test, however, is no longer routinely practiced and if done, there should be resuscitation facilities and atropine available. In some cases, a CT scan of the thorax can be indicated to look for thymic changes. In the management of myasthenia gravis, Long-term cholinesterase inhibitors such as pyridostigmine can be given, though often has cholinergic side effects such as salivation, lacrimation, sweating, meiosis, diarrhea, and vomiting. Immunosuppression can be considered for relapsing cases. Drugs such as prednisolone, azathioprine, methotrexate, methylprednisolone, IV, or plasma exchange can be done. Thymectomy if a patient has a thymoma, it can be beneficial, especially in treatment-resistant myasthenia gravis, even if the thymoma is absent. With treatment, individuals have a normal life expectancy.